This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have an opportunity, I think, tonight um, to learn from two people who I think if you combined all of their experience in international relations, negotiations, foreign policy, the Middle East, and more specifically, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they have about 60 to 65 years of experience. That's a rough guess. It's, a, it's indeed a, a great, great privilege for me um, to share the stage with them, uh, Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, uh, and I'm not going to summarize all of the material that's in your program brochure, uh, but he has had a distinguished career um, in uh, American uh, diplomacy, and Raith Alamari, um, who is at the present time a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, um, who also has an extraordinary experience in Palestinian um, uh, and Israeli um, um, negotiations. Tonight, what I'd like to suggest is that we each, we ask each of our um, speakers to present approximately 15 minutes of overview on the topic which, as you know, is U.S. foreign policy and the chaotic Middle East. And at the end of both of their presentations, we will have a conversation, me with them, and at the end of that conversation, we'll invite you to join in the conversation with your questions. So now please uh, let me ask you to welcome Ambassador Mark Ginsburg and Raith Alamari. Ambassador Ginsburg. Good evening, my fellow West Coasters, and I'm an East Coaster and very jealous of you. Uh, I'm very honored to be here for the Talmud Symposium, and I want to thank Richard. I want to thank you for being here this evening. I also want to express my deep appreciation for the kindness of the uh, university for hosting us. And uh, as Richard said, I want to give you a short overview of someone who was raised in the Middle East, spent most of my professional career in the Arab world, and who has, shall we say, a healthy, realistic sense of idealism of what I hope for the Middle East, but I'm practical enough as a advisor and military advisor to the Special Operations Command to know what is possible and what is not. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, remember the good old days of Dwight David Eisenhower. Remember when the Middle East was a figment of Americans' imagination. We negotiated an agreement with the King of Saudi Arabia in 1948. You give us the gas and we'll provide you the security, but we never were the colonial power we weren't Winston Churchill's scribe in the Sykes-Picot Treaty. We were the actual honest broker in the region. The British and the French were busy with their machinations in the region. And it was only as a result, more or less, of the 1967 war that we found ourselves under Lyndon and Baines Johnson involved in the post-conflict new reality that was created as a result of Israel's seizure of the West Bank and of the Sinai Peninsula. And then there was, of course, after 67, the 1973 War of the Day of Atonement, Henry Kissinger's efforts to negotiate 
a separation agreement between Egyptians and Israelis, and then the incredible courage of Anwar Sadat going to Jerusalem to show Israel that there was a partner in the Arab world willing to make peace. And I was working on Camp David as the deputy advisor to the President of the United States. And I remember those were hopeful days. America was at the pinnacle of its efforts to forge not only a peace between Israel and its first major Arab adversary, but also to help bring about a Palestinian state. And as I keep reminding my friends, I've been gainfully employed ever since making peace in the Middle East, decades later. What has happened to us and what is our interest in the reason and why has it been so derailed from a nation that has had nothing but the slightest interest in Israel's security as our strong democratic ally in the region to making sure we had sufficient energy supplies coming from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states? What were the decisions that led us to be in the position that we're in today? And my job here tonight is not to dwell on the mistakes of the past, of which God knows there are many, but to share with you my expectations as a policymaker as to what the United States must do to disentangle itself once again in a way that leaves us more or less in a position of where we were, respected, feared, admired, and left alone, okay? That ultimately are the four things that I wanna see for the United States in the Middle East. When President Obama took the office of presidency, he set about trying to do what he felt were the major errors under his predecessor, an engagement in a decades-long conflict in Afghanistan and a decades-long conflict in Iraq. His administration was committed to ending both wars. And on March, in Mar in, sorry, in June of 2009, he made his seminal trip to Cairo, where the president delivered an extraordinary speech to the Arab and broader Muslim world. That speech set the tone of what was the great expectations of the current administration's goals and objectives in the Middle East. An outreach to reconciliation in a Muslim world that had become less than enamored, to put it charitably, with US foreign policy in the region, that had viewed us as the source of evil in the region, that had been the target of bin Laden's attacks, that had, in effect, been unable to reconcile its love and value system of democracy and dealing with the real politic interests of tyrannical regimes and corrupt regimes in the region that were at least designated the moniker of stable allies for us. It has been the tension between reconciling these two dichotomies, our value system as a democracy, our desire to see people have a decent progressive way of life in the region, and at the same time, our recognition that stability in the, in the Middle East is essential, unfortunately, to America's long-term security. And that is where our first goal and objective is going forward, protecting you, the homeland, making sure that whatever turmoil Whatever Pandora's box is open, whatever is the next vestige of Islamic extremism, whatever may the Israelis do, whatever may be the latest catastrophe of the 74 tribes in Libya, that it does not come back to the United States and inflict harm, danger, and insecurity on our great people. And the overriding goal of homeland security has got to be first and foremost 
a US foreign policy objective in the region that's based not so much on closing off our involvement in a region, but containing the threat that we can do bilaterally and what we must do multilaterally. It is not by accident that what I have seen ever since I started studying Islamic uh, jihadi ideology from the 30s and watched it move through its generational divide from the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood and Said Qutb, who is the great ideological breadwinner of modern day Islamic jihadi extremism, and who was in effect, whose brother in effect taught bin Laden everything that bin Laden claimed to know. Where on God's good earth did we find ourselves in a position of being the target on 9-11? To this day, when I lecture around the world on the genesis of the Quranic jihadi ideology as a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, New York, I do so with an understanding that what we are are mere pawns in what essentially is a centuries-old conflict between an Arab world and a broader Muslim world that has not gone through its own reformation to understand how to make that religion, which is respected and admired by hundreds of millions of Muslims and Arabs who would never dare pick up a gun or a weapon to, to hurt or threaten anyone, and, was, and which is now hijacked by those who claim that they speak in the name of religion, but they're really just common criminals, and they're terrorists. And whatever may be their motives and reasons, they do want to pose and, and represent a threat to us. What the President of the United States going forward, whoever he or she may be, must do is recognize what we have failed to understand in understanding what happened after 9-11. That it is not our responsibility to reform Islam. That Americans cannot do this. What we can do is to help empower those who must do it for us and for their own sake. It's easier said than done, because right now, everyone is focused on ISIS, the Islamic State. And when one understands what the Islamic State represents and the sudden in, in, uh, incredible recruitment techniques that it has mastered, where every day, and just today you heard what took place when the FBI arrested three uh, young Americans, at least Americans with green cards, who are going to make their way as the latest recruiters, recruitment fodder for ISIS. It's not just ISIS that is the threat. It is the whole uh, smorgasbord of Islamic extremist groups stretching from Nigeria to Somalia, through Yemen into Iraq, all of the franchise groups of the Islamic bin Laden ideology that has now been, in some respects, put us at greater risk than we have been since 9-11. The homeland has got to be our focus. The second focus of our attention has got to be trying to ensure that the moderate Arab states that stand for some type of stable reconciliation among them, Sunni and Shiite, will do what they can to try to put this horrific centuries-old conflict that has now been sprung as a result of the war that broke out in Syria. Syria, ladies and gentlemen, is a humanitarian, cataclysmic event for the Middle East. It has reopened the horrific failure of Islam to reconcile who is the rightful heir to the Prophet Muhammad. And the hatred that none of us really can understand unless we were living back in the 12th century and either were a Catholic or a Protestant, and went to war with each other over, over your defining theology of what you believed in Jesus Christ, it's hard for us to understand how much that hatred is now capturing and driving what essentially is ISIS's ability to recruit, 
to train and to mobilize. It takes American foreign policy to understand we have to speak truth to the American people and to let them understand that there are threats that have to be dealt with, and if we don't deal with them now, they could become bigger threats later on. I fault my colleagues in the administration, not on their desire to achieve great things, because if you read the president's speech or you see what he was trying to do uh, in, in, during the Arab Spring, no one had great answers. But boy, we've been, sh we've been really a failure when it comes to constructing strategy. And it's the strategic aims of reconciling what the Shiite and Sunni powers must do that are necessary. I'm going to wrap up by saying, talking about, for a minute, about Iran. The President of the United States, whoever he or she may be, is going to inherit either an agreement that was negotiated to cease Iran's nuclear enrichment program that constitutes a potential threat because it may lead to the creation of a nuclear weapon. If we reach an agreement, as Secretary Kerry is trying to do, the one thing that I have no illusions about is that despite the naivety in, in, of many who believe that this will open up a new era in U.S.-Iranian relations, I think not. I think what it does is put us off a war footing of having to go to war with Iran over its nuclear weapons program, at least for the time being. There isn't an American that I know of that wants to send their mother, their son or daughter to go fight another war in the Middle East, particularly with Iran. Maybe the Saudis want us to do their dirty work for them, but I don't want to see Americans to do that if that can be avoided, which is why I want to see an agreement that is necessary and can be, in effect, maintained. But I also have no illusions that there's no such thing as moderate mullahs either. Iran's support for terrorism in the Middle East, for undermining the capacity of moderate Sunni states to be able to grow and to reconcile their own challenges in Iraq and in Syria are legendary. Whether it's support for Hezbollah, it's support for Hamas, it's support for the Houthi rebels. It's going to take a many a generation for us to reach a point where we have a comfort level. Let me wrap up this by saying the following. I want to see the Arab world prosper. I want to see the same thing that Arabs want, for, that we want for our children. Education, opportunity, an end of corruption, a re accountable government. But anyone who preaches democracy to the Middle East doesn't understand that in a region right now that is so un unsure of itself and uncertain where it is heading, what we can do as a country is to provide them the incentive to take the steps that they need. And what we can do best for ourselves is to first and foremost avoid taking actions that are going to put us back in a situation of resolving conflicts that we cannot resolve. And the sooner that we understand that it's up to the Arabs to reconcile these conflicts themselves, the better off the Arab world and the United States will be. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that's going to be a hard one to follow, Mark. Um, it's really a pleasure being uh, again here. This is, I think, my fourth year, and I always come back, uh, partly because of the uh, great intellectual stimulation that I find in my time here. I must say partly because, you know, compared to 18 degrees sub-freezing DC, this is really, you know, quite enticing. Um, I'm going to, I mean, first of all, I would say that uh, much of what Mark said I agree with. And you will see a repeat of some of the same, same themes because we are dealing with these issues no matter how you deal with it. But I would look at it maybe from a different angle. Mark started with the general laying out uh, interest, US interest there. I would actually start looking at the specifics and see how those translate and how those uh, relate to our interests. 
And I, I would start by saying, before I go into that, this, I have never seen the Middle East this messy. It is the most complicated uh, I've seen, maybe since the 20s, the 1920s, that is. The region is changing, and we really don't know where it's going. And therefore, I really don't envy the administration and our leadership in this country trying to navigate that one. Now, that said, though, the US, as we involve, get involved today in the region, as a result of a number of decisions that were made or not made, we are perceived in a very negative way that we have not been perceived at, again, for a very long time. I can't even remember since when. If you talk to our traditional allies in the region, the Israelis, the Gulf states, Jordan, Morocco, Iraq, they will tell you that they see the United States right now as a power that is trying to relinquish leadership in the region, as a power that is not willing to put its uh, um, true assets where its policies are. And by that, I don't only mean unwilling to use military force, but unwilling to use other of our assets that we have that we can influence the region. And we are seen as well, sadly, as a country that rewards its enemies and reaches out and runs after its enemies and punishes its friends. Now, much of that is an exaggeration. And any of you who've dealt with the Middle East know that in the Middle East, they like to exaggerate about what we do in the United States. However, this is a very deeply held view in the region. And as such, in politics, perception is reality. And this is a perception that we have to contend with as we go into uh, involvement in the region. Now, as the US involves with the, gets involved in the region, I think the first question that we ask ourselves, and that's something that Mark uh, pointed on or touched on, is what can we do and can, what cannot we do? What can we not do? There are many problems in the region. The debate within Islam, the issues of reform, political Islam itself, the breakdown of states, uh, terrorism, etc. Some of these are things that we are equipped and we are capable of dealing with. Others with, uh, are ones that we cannot. You mentioned the debate within Islam, Mark. And I fully agree with you. This is not something for us. Not something for us, us as a government. It's something for the Muslims to do. For the Muslims in the Middle East, the Muslims in the larger Muslim world. And of course, there is a big role to be played by Muslims in America. And it's a role that is being played right now. But it's not the role of the government to engage in some of these identity issues that the region and the faith of Islam has to resolve for itself be it Shia Sunni, be it the issue of who speaks for Islam. This is their issue, not our issue. Then there are a set of issues that are for the region to deal with, but we can make an impact in terms of their willingness and ability to deal with them. Issues like, for example, the failure of governance. If I look at the Arab Spring, one of the core, in my view, roots behind it is the failure of Arab states throughout the region at varying degrees to actually govern properly to provide to their people what the government should provide to its public. Now, we're going to do it for them. But what we can do is if we make this as a core demand in our foreign policy, every time we talk with any Arab leader, we insist that this is something that will be part of our defining our relation, our aid is conditioned on something like this. We might not force them to do it, but we will change their cost-benefit calculus when they think of whether or not they want to go down that way. Then there is, a there is a bundle of issues that requires, in my view, direct American uh, engagement. Some of these are challenges, and some of these are opportunities. The challenges are many, and I cannot uh, touch all on them. You look at Yemen, you look at Libya, you look at all of those. So I'm going to focus really on one issue, the one that has been really in the news more uh, recently, and in an attempt to explain some of the complexities that face the way that we have to deal with it. And I will look at the issue of ISIS. Now, I have no doubt that there is a need for a military uh, um, intervention with ISIS. And I have no doubt that ISIS will crumble very quickly um, when faced with a proper, trained, disciplined, capable military. And it's very interesting to me to look at the speed with which the coalition around ISIS was formed. The speed with which Arab countries jumped into this coalition, knowing the misgivings that they have, many of them have, in terms of the scope of the coalition and the objective of this coalition. To me, this indicates two things. The region is aware, acutely aware, of the threat that ISIS presents. And the region is thirsty for American leadership, that they are jumping on any opportunity to uh, work within that context. The problem with ISIS, of course, if you want to truly defeat ISIS, not only tactically defeat it, the issue of ISIS can only be resolved, in my view, 
in the context of resolving the Syrian issue, the larger Syrian problem. If you look at it from a human perspective, the atrocities of ISIS are no more horrific than the atrocities of the Syrian uh, Assad regime, which uses uh, indiscriminate bombing, starvation as a tool of war. And if we do not deal with the problem of uh, ISIS in the context of uh, Syria, then it's only a matter of time till a second incarnation, a new incarnation of ISIS will emerge. And indeed, with Syria in particular, I think one of the defining moments for the perception, the negative perception of the US that we see is the famous red line episode where the president laid out a red line and then was perceived in the region as walking back from it. And therefore our inability and willing, unwillingness to deal with Syria will make any further intervention um, less effective. Now the problem with Syria, of course, if you want to really have a resolution of Syria, there is no escape dealing with the issue of Iran. Because ultimately, Syria is not only a Syrian issue. Syria, the Syrian Assad regime, is propped up only by the support of Iran directly and through its proxies, Hezbollah and some of the Iraqi uh, Shia militias. And therefore, any attempt to deal with Syria would necessitate us dealing with some of the aspects that Mark mentioned about Iran. And I look at the region, and I talk to both Israelis and to Arabs, our traditional allies there. And they are baffled by the fact that we choose to deal with Syria, I mean, sorry, with, with Iran, as a one-dimensional issue, the issue of the nuclear weapons. Now, of course, the issue of the nuclear weapons is core. It is the most pressing issue, and I agree with Mark, it can only be, best, uh, it can only be resolved through diplomacy. Yet, the perception in the region is that as we are engaged with uh, Iran on uh, nuclear negotiations, Iran has been using this time to extend its uh, influence in uh, Iraq, in Syria, now in Yemen, and so there is a great concern among some of our traditional allies in terms of what are we doing? Are we pivoting? Are we leaving them alone? And therefore, in my view, any, any real policy that can deal with Syria and some of these issues will have to tackle Iran, both in terms of approaching Iran on a holistic matter and ensuring that they understand very clearly that a nuclear deal is not a carte blanche for them to uh, extend their hegemony, but also engaging our allies and making them feel that we understand their concerns and we are willing to help them meet with these uh, concerns. Now, the objective of what I just said, this very quick, very maybe superficial uh, presentation, is to show that in the region right now, no problem is separate from another problem. And we do need maybe not a uniform strategy because every conflict is different and every problem is different, but a framework that allows us to understand and resolve the interlinkage between that. It will be, though, I mean, incomplete. My, my presentation will be incomplete if I only talk about the challenges. Because there are opportunities. And as much as we need to be seen as dealing with the challenges as a way of, re of restoring American leadership and a way of restoring not only respect for America, but also awe from America and fear, and frankly, fear matters in that region, there are opportunities that will show that we are more than just a colonial power, if we play that right. And I will mention two of these. I look at a country like Jordan and a country like uh, Morocco. These are countries, by no means democracies, yet they have leaderships that have understood from the, even before the Arab Spring, the need to engage with some reform. Now, this is maybe slow and not as fast and not as uh, intensive as we would like it, but there are positive tendencies there. It is incumbent upon us, I think, to help and support these tendencies so that no one can say, any further, that we only uh, you know, uh, reward our enemies and we neglect our friends. We have to look at these positive trends and enforce them as we do that. And then I would look for another at another example. I look at Tunisia. I don't know how many of you are aware of Tunisia. It's a very small country in North Africa. Yet Tunisia has been in the only Arab Spring country that has actually been going through a remarkable democratic transition a democratic transition in its own right that is amazing, but also a process of the Islamist parties playing a responsible, constructive part in the political process. It is essential, I believe, for us in the United States to support this kind of transition. Because when the dust settles, once we have dealt with ISIS, once we have dealt with some of these aggressive uh, issues, we also need to be able to stand up and point and say, for those of you who want to play it right, there is a model of success. 
And if we uh, engage, if you do this model of success, we will be there uh, behind you and supporting you. To me, it's unconscionable to think that today, our level of support for Tunisia is equivalent to the support that we used to give Tunisia under Ben Ali, the dictator who was uh, toppled by the Arab Spring. In conclusion, I would say the following. As Mark pointed out, we have interest in the region that will ensure that we will continue being involved in that region for a long time. Those who are thinking about pivot to Asia, you know, dream on. We are stuck there for a while. What do we do there? To navigate, we need a policy that understands and tackles the interrelation between these issues. And we need a policy that shows us not only as an aggressive power, but as a power for good and a support for good trends. And we have to realize, if we continue to approach the issue piecemeal, we will win many tactical victories. Yet, when the dust settles, I fear that failure to approach it comprehensively will mean that we will lose la the larger war and our larger leadership role in that region. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Now, I want to see if I can frame what I heard may be similar to yours or it may be different, but um, Ambassador Ginsburg uh, made the point that religion is absolutely critical in, at least understanding religion is absolutely critical uh, toward American policy in the Middle East. And so I'd like to push that a bit with you. Do we actually have people <laughs> in the State Department or in, at levels of policy making who really know anything about religion. And how did, how did religion explode um, into this uh, crescent of, of animosity that reaches from Western North Africa all the way over to Afghanistan? How did it arise? I mean, how do you explain this? I blame Bill Maher for all of this. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's interesting, as someone who has spent uh, so many years in the Middle East where it made no difference if your last name gave off the connotation as, as it does if you were Shiite, or in Morocco, uh, they didn't really care whether you were Jewish or Muslim. It, it's interesting because I... I think it's almost hard for Arabs to understand mm -hmm. that the Pandora's box of what has been blown apart in Syria has reopened this schism that we haven't seen in, 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 almost, in several centuries. You know, when the Ottoman Empire ruled the, the Middle East as this dominant Sunni power, we didn't really have much to get concerned about because there was the Shah and the Iran, which is not an Arab state, Persian. The idea that after the 79 revolution in Iran, the mullahs following the precepts of Shiite, a sense of Shiite victimization, were determined to create a dominance of a Shiite crescent stretching from Iran across to Iraq, Hezbollah into Lebanon. There's a reason for this. There was a reason for the revolution in Iran. If you ask me where it began, at least in our lifetime, it began there. It began there. And we tend to forget, to a large extent, how much that revolution in Iran has infected religion back into what essentially were the post-dictatorship colonial nature of the Arab world. And then the revolution that commenced in Syria. You know, if you had asked me whether of all the regimes in the Middle East, the one that would be the most bloody in terms of post-Arab Spring would be Syria, I would have said, you don't know anything about the Middle East. And I was dead wrong. And by the way, 
I'd like to hear more of American policymakers say I was dead wrong as well. That would be a good cleansing sense for all of us. You know, when we invested so much with Prime Minister Maliki, remember what President Obama's goals were, noble goals. We want to get out of Iraq. We turn the keys over to a prime minister that was determined to exacerbate the Sunni-Shiite divide, persecute Sunnis as a result of the fall, after the fall of Saddam Hussein, and recreate himself as a proxy puppet for the Iranian mullahs. ISIS, the creation of ISIS, to a large extent is directly attributable to the mess that the president left when he turned the keys over to Mr. Maliki. And when the administration was warned, this is not the right guy to leave in charge of the store. In some respects, and I don't enjoy saying this, could there have been an alternative? Could we have avoided this mess that has created this religiosity, this war? that is now claiming lives and barbarity and f manners that none of us could ever think other than harking back to the worst torture chambers that existed in the middle centuries, or the middle ages. We've made our share of mistakes by trying to abandon the region and thinking that by doing so we could claim victory. We did that in Vietnam and got away with it we are not doing the same in Iraq. And we certainly, as my friend Rafe has said, Syria, by declaring that our goal was to get rid of Assad, and not therefore then following up with every effort to try to make that bring about when it should have been, has only exacerbated the situation. Is it our fault? God help us if we put all of this blame on ourselves. But let's be, under, let's be very clear here. The Middle East is a mess, it's a jungle out there. And if we don't understand when we need to jump into the trees, when the elephants are trampling through the forest, through the jungle, it, we have no one to blame but ourselves. And that means knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, and putting people in charge, excuse me, let me just make this one comment. I believe that foreign policy is made by people sometimes with the best of intentions, and sometimes by people who, with the best of intentions, make mistakes. My biggest gripe with the Obama administration's Middle East policy is that there's absolutely no one who's been given authority within this White House who has spent more than two weeks of their life in the Middle East. Um, Rafe, do you, would you like to say anything in response to my pressing Ambassador uh, Ginsburg for this issue on religion? Yes, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> now, maybe, first of all, to echo a couple of things that you said, uh, Mark. First of all, I mean, just, just to clarify, uh, it is not the US's fault that these things happened, and I will get to a moment some of the structural issues of the Middle East that caused this to happen. And it is not the, admi the Obama administration's fault. Of all of this, I look back at the uh, invasion on Iraq, not the removal of Saddam, which I personally think is a good thing, but the way we managed the day after scenario. So this is something that ma many share a blame, yet today we are under this administration and therefore what we expect is this administration to act in a certain uh, way. And in this, I actually truly agree with Mark. You ask, do, is, do you have anyone in government who understand this issue? Of course we have. We have diplomats and we have military and we have intelligence people who spent so much time there. They know enough. The question is we don't have structures right now and processes that bring in this uh, knowledge into decision making. I think this is one of the major failures. Now, if you go back to the issue of where did this, all of this uh, come from? And I agree a lot with Mark in uh, what he said, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but I'm gonna add a different dimension. I think what we see in the Arab world, and this started really in the 70s and got much worse until the 90s, is a bankruptcy of many of the ideologies. The liberation, leftist, uh, socialist ideology that came in the 50s and 60s failed when regimes like Nasser and regimes like the Ba'ath regime in Syria and Iraq turned out to be 
you know, dictatorship and dynastic, uh, um, you know, monarchies uh, uh, under the guise of uh, republics. Pro-Western liberals were only pro-Western liberals in name. They were mainly kleptocrats, and they were mainly people who actually never really tried to engage. So you end up with an Arab world where all of these ideologies and these all, all of these larger organizing principles have been completely discredited. Between Islam, between the revolution in Iran, and between the organization of some of these Islamist parties like the Muslim Brotherhood and their use of the mosque as a way of recruiting, it was only natural that Islam will come in and uh, take part, uh, be the part or be, be the, to fill this vacuum. Now what happened with Islam over the last few years is also enhanced with political Islam, has enhanced and expedited the process. We saw after the Arab Spring, uh, most of the people who managed, or a political movement, that managed to gain, to win from the, from, political, from the Arab Spring were the Islamists. We saw in Egypt, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood winning the elections. Yet they bungled it so bad. If you look at Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood, they failed so badly in governance that it made it very easy for the army to come and take over. Now, I'm personally not very unhappy that the Muslim Brotherhood is no longer there. But within the Islamist movement itself, a, a narrative developed whereby ISIS and people like ISIS are saying, see, try working through the political system and you will be removed immediately by the army. And this added to the, uh, to the radicalization. Then comes Syria. All of this suffering and no action by anyone, our failure to support the Free Syrian Army early on, added to uh, that thing. All of these things come together, and that's why for me it's very important. I mentioned Tunisia in passing. For me, to have a model of success where an Islamist party that is willing to play democratic game properly, not only one man, one vote once, but truly uh, participate in it, it's very important because that will allow me and allow us in this country to point out, and people in the Middle East as well, to talk to the ISIS people and say, you know what, no, if you engage in the political process in a, in a proper, normal, um, sincere way, you have a place in the game. Other, if we don't do that, I think the ability to uh, radicalize will continue to be stronger because there will be no way to uh, counter it from within the Islamist narrative itself. Now, I want to ask you a question about something that um, Wraith um, uh, made central in his presentation, and that is the issue of legitimacy and governance. How do you uh, help or uh, foster uh, these two critical elements of legitimacy of a regime and, on the other hand, governance? Well, I've lived through the ex experiments of theoretical, <laughs> idealistic, dem democratic uh, infusions by many in an American administration. I remember when Condi Rice, uh, as Wraith will <laughs> acknowledge, she said, let's give the Palestinians a vote and make sure Hamas gets the vote as well. Because if they have a vote, they will be responsible as for the democratic evolution of a Palestinian state. Well, we know what happened in Gaza as a result of them getting the vote. Um, you know, in the Arab world, what people really want are institutions that are accountable. Mm -hmm. An independent judiciary. A policeman that doesn't take a bribe, the fire engine that will come to the house without having, get the, getting, having to take a bribe, one of the most incredible plays that was ever produced by an Egyptian playwright was a play about how his family died in a terrible incendiary fire in their home, and he was in heaven asking God why he couldn't get the, the fire, fire truck to come in time to save his family. And it's because the fire chief had not been paid a bribe. Now, you and I know that bribery exists all over the world. But the pernicious sense of how institutions work where people are not held accountable in most, many Middle East countries is what drives Arabs. And if it was you, you'd feel the same way. You know how it feels when the, when the local, agri, local uh, uh, tax 
authority doesn't answer the phone or give you a straight answer or is demanding a bribe for you to, in order to get what you are entitled to under the law. How do we help? It's not the democracy issue that I, I, I don't like talking about democracy. It's about institutional civil society support. <clears throat> and there are institutions in the US government that do that, the International Republican Institute, the, Dem the National Democratic Institute. Uh, my organization, which is called the One Voice Movement, is promoting grassroots civil society development in Palestine and Israel. Uh, if we were smart enough to understand that we Americans would gain so much trust and respect, if all that we did, instead of talking about the talk of democracy, is doing what is necessary to support civil society initiatives in many of these countries, like Ray said, in Morocco, where I was ambassador, or in Jordan. I mean, take a country like Morocco. The king, young king, recognized the importance of reform and getting ahead of the Arab Spring. Has he done everything that he sh could be doing? No. Has he done far more than anyone else ever expected? Absolutely. Are Moroccans far better off as a result of having, him having the foresight to understand what is necessary in order to devolve power from the monarchy, to give more power to the people in a way that held him accountable? Yes. Is it possible in the Middle East? Exhibit A. Reith, I wonder if you might um, speak to uh, the issue of how this legitimacy and governance can be stimulated and supported, given the context that um, Mark has suggested uh, the building up of civil society. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I, I mean, I agree with you, Mark. There's a reason why I didn't say democracy. I said uh, governance, because these are two very different things, and it's about institutions. And to be honest, I mean, I would, you spoke as a former ambassador with your experience. Let me speak as a former Palestinian official. And maybe not di di directly to the civil society, but to the larger issue of how do we... I mean, I was a Palestinian official uh, when Bush decided that uh, he's going to push for reform. So we had our meeting with the Americans, and they talked about reform and governance. And of course, we've heard that a million times before. So we sat there, smiled, nodded politely. And you know, we're snickering in the back of our minds, yeah, whatever. When it then became an issue that was raised in every meeting we had with every American official, we started paying attention. And when suddenly the Europeans started showing up and talking about the same uh, thing, not in their own volition, but by, through prodding by the United States, we started taking, uh, paying attention to that. And when the donors started doing this linkage between reform and donations, we really started paying attention. Now, what happened at that point, Arafat, who was the president, was in no way interested in reform. He thrived through the corruption that he created. But he realized he had to do something about it. And when the process of reform started, what happened beyond the actually mechanics of reform, people who were competent, who were capable, started surfacing to the, uh, emerging in the surface. So what the international community did in the reform process was not only giving us technical assistance, but creating a dynamic that opened the political space to allow for new leaders, leaders who are based in competence and capability to emerge. Some of you might have heard of Salam Fayyad, a, foreign, a former Palestinian prime minister. This is how he emerged. So if I don't talk about how do you come up with the issues of reform, government to government, we need to have it as a central part of our uh, uh, policy, not as we used to do in the past. You know, we hear it in the opening statements, and that's the last time you hear it in a, in a speech. And we also, by the way, and one thing that I found very useful in that experience that I was in, as we were under pressure from the Europeans and the Americans and everyone, we were also being offered help. The idea was, if you don't do it, you get punished. If you do it, this is an, a back, basket of incentive that you get with that. So I think this kind of internalization is important. Of course, the other thing that relates to civil society is not governance-oriented. Look, you look at Egypt, for example. And these examples of uh, jailing all of these activists and whatnot. We can never truly, completely change the behavior of these governments, but it's important for issues like this, when they happen, for us to raise them. To raise them consistently. Not only with the hope of changing government uh, support, but for those on the ground who are activists, who are doing these brave things, and who are really going there, challenging their authorities, to understand that someone knows and someone cares outside. 
We might not necessarily change overnight, but we do give them a sense of uh, support and a sense of uh, that they are part of a larger community. And I think this is something that we failed most, I think, obviously, in our response to the whole Green Revolution in Iran, where they were looking not necessarily for material support, but a sense that the world understands and supports them. So I think a bit of all of these things can start shifting the policy everywhere. One last point is, as we do that, we also have to understand that this will at some times compete with other interests, and therefore, Human rights and reform and things of this sort important, but they are not our only driving in, uh, interest, and we have to find a way of balancing the difference, uh, the different interests that we have in engaging the region. Yeah, you know, there's one issue that you've touched upon, but we haven't we haven't focused on it, and that is the place of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in um, American foreign policy. Um, so could you comment on, on this? Well, let's, let's put this in now in cold, crass political and foreign policy terms because we can all get emotionally caught up in this issue. From a, from a strategic perspective, I think it's fair to say that whether or not there is a settlement between Palestinians and Israelis in the next year is not going to resolve the situation with Iran, is not going to resolve the situation with ISIS, is not going to resolve the situation with Syria. And once upon a time, we all believed, and it was almost a mantra within the US government, that, with, that without resolving the Arab, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, we will not be able to resolve any other issue. Now, it's fair to say that that's no longer the case. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I don't have time to get into, but let me say from the perspective of putting an issue to bed that could be put to bed in a way that could pay dividends later on, I consider it to be an essential component of our, what I would say, broader strategic goals in the Middle East to bringing about a Palestinian state that lives safely and securely side by side with an Israel that is also safe and secure uh, in the Middle East. Now, when President Obama went to Cairo and he talked about the importance of bringing about this effort, he certainly invested a considerable amount of time through his envoy, George Mitchell, and John Kerry's latest initiative, peace initiative. The fact of the matter is, is that I have long ago come to the conclusion that we've gone about this as far as we can in a way that we no longer can and should do. And that is to believe that a Palestinian-Israeli conflict can be resolved by the United States directly helping both parties decide for themselves what's good or bad. Uh, I've watched many of the people who you've come to know, Dennis Ross and Martin Indyk and others, who've given their life to the process of peace. What has been missing from this is the fact that both Israelis and Palestinians don't want to make the hard choices or are politically paralyzed making the hard choices. And I'm going to put a pox on both their houses. Neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians can now make or are ready to make the hard choices. There's got to be a new dynamic, and that dynamic is going to be an Arab world, particularly a Sunni Arab world, that recognizes the importance of putting this issue to bed because there's a new strategic framework that will emerge in the Middle East by which Israel will be a strategic ally of Sunni states in the region, which can only come about as a result of that issue being resolved in a way that would reconcile Sunni Arab states making peace with Israel as well. Great. Um, maybe, maybe let me recollect uh, an incident I had during the Bush administration. I was visiting Washington and I happened to bump into uh, a very senior official who was on, uh, not Condé Rice, by the way, on her way back uh, from uh, the region on her first visit. And she was amazed. She was telling me, I knew her from a different capacity, that, whoa, I was saying to everyone, you know, Iraq, 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 and the response from the Arabs was Palestine, Palestine, Palestine. That was then. Today, 
if you ask any American official who goes to the region, no matter what we say to the regions, they will come back to us and say, Iran, Iran, Iran. The issue right now, if you look at all of the mess in the region, Syria, breakdown of Iraq, all of these uh, other issues, for the region itself, the issue is not pressing. Particularly because there isn't you know, a sense that it's an issue that can be resolved it's not at the moment. There isn't a sense that the Palestinians are Israelis are really all that keen on resolving it. For the region right now, it is not a high priority. And that's one of the reasons why, that's the reason why it was not in my presentation. However, I think some people take this a bit too far. And I hear often in Washington and elsewhere, people saying, uh, people almost gloating, ha, we told you so, it is not central. Well, in my view, this is an issue that uh, waxes and wanes. And today it's not central, but this is an issue that has a way of asserting itself often on the, uh, on the agenda. And if you act, if, listen, I mean, right now, look at Yemen. The Houthis who took over Yemen, you look at their uh, slogan, it is uh, well, death to America, death to Israel, and uh, freedom for Palestine. And there in Yemen, they couldn't care less about Palestine. It's an issue that is uh, very um, emotive. From the United States, I think what we need to do as we approach, and this is again what I would fault Secretary Kerry, we need to have a sober look at ourselves and ask ourselves how much political and diplomatic capital are we truly willing to expend in trying to resolve this issue? And I think there's no shame in saying that right now, the bandwidth does not allow us to, to expend too much political capital. We're too busy with all the issues, Iran, Syria, whatnot. But determine how much we're willing to do and design our policy to fit how much we are willing to do. If we go big and fail, this will add to the perception that this is an unresolvable uh, conflict. If we go modest but succeed, we can start building a pattern where we can show that a well-considered, moderate, modest, but ultimately effective intervention will build a trajectory of success that ultimately might lead us to the final resolution of the issue. Mark. I just want to add something perhaps a little bit flip. But this issue will take front and center when you see Anderson Cooper in a tight T-shirt <laughs> in the summer or during the Gaza conflict. <laughs> and the entire world is focused on missiles <clears throat> flying and Israel's attacks in Gaza and <clears throat> diplomats scurrying all over the universe trying to resolve the conflict. And then all of a sudden it goes away again. And then the sooner, within months, it'll be back again. And, it'll, and once again, Anderson Cooper will be there in his black T-shirt along with Will Blitzer and all the others. And they'll all be standing there wanting to cover this conflict and saying, why are we not doing more to resolve the conflict? And then once again, it'll dissipate because it's not bleeding anymore in front of the cameras. I'm a cynic when I see that because I understand the ebb and flow of what takes place. The fact of the matter is, is that media, how much the media has driven our foreign policy, whether it's the incredible dastardly beheadings of these young, wonderful Americans, that have lost their lives to ISIS, or the Palestinians who've died in Gaza, or the Israelis who've been victimized by Hamas's missile attacks and kidnappings. The media, in some respects, is writing foreign policy, and I'd like to find a foreign policy that is not written by the media. <laughs> so I think you will agree with me that we have had a very rich uh, discussion with uh, Mark Ginsburg and Raith Alamari. And so will you join me in thanking the two of these wonderful people for helping us understand the Middle East. Thank you.